a vicious assassination, a brutal beheading, and the firing squad. What did these royals say when they faced death? Let's find out. Thanks to a complicated web of European alliances, Franz Ferdinand's assassination in 1914 led directly to World War I. But the assassination was much more chaotic and had more victims than many might know. A group of Serbian radicals decided to kill the royal when he was in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was then a part of the Austrian Empire. The attack was actually conceived as a bombing, and indeed there was a bomb. It did not get to his intended target, though. Not knowing what it was, Franz Ferdinand actually swatted the small bomb away when he saw a projectile heading toward his wife, Sophie, who was also in the car. The resulting explosion did, however, wound many innocent victims who had come to see him drive by in his open car. After the explosion, the Archduke actually got out to try and help those who were injured before continuing on to his original destination. Later that day, Franz Ferdinand changed his official schedule to go see the bombing victims in the hospital. This time, the car drove past another member of the terror cell, Gavrilo Princip, who shot both the Archduke and his wife. Sophie. According to Sarajevo, the story of a political murder, as the dying Franz Ferdinand was rushed away for help, he kept repeating in German, it is nothing. As rulers of Scotland and England, when they were still two separate countries, Mary, Queen of Scots, and Queen Elizabeth I of England were natural rivals, even though they were also first cousins once removed. After years of political machinations in Scotland, Mary fled to England, where she was locked up by Elizabeth. The English queen tried to avoid executing her cousin, but when Mary was implicated in a plot against Elizabeth, it was clear she was a danger to her throne and had to go. It was perhaps ironic that Mary was sentenced to die by beheading, as Elizabeth's mother Anne Boleyn had also been. Mary Stuart is condemned to death. Mary's final hours on February 8, 1587 were recorded in great detail. According to Elizabeth and Mary, Cousins, Rivals, Queens by Jane Dunn, a dean from the Church of England tried to get her to convert before her execution, but the staunchly Catholic Mary refused. According to the 1923 book Trial of Mary, Queen of Scots, she faced death bravely. While all her attendants were crying, Mary insisted she was about to be very happy. She wore bright red petticoats, clearly a commentary on her fate. She tried to get the whole thing over with quickly, laying her head on the block and repeating Jesus' last words in Luke 23, 46, which translate to, O Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. George V died in 1936, and for decades his death was put down to natural causes. In reality, as the New York Times reported in 1986, the king's doctor recorded in his notes that he gave the unconscious dying man a lethal overdose. Original reporting on George's final words were as sanitized as his cause of death with the public told that, at the very end, George was still thinking about the state of the realm. Later, the public somehow started a rumor that the king's last words were actually Bugger Bogner. Bogner Regis is a coastal town that was considered a good place for invalids to recuperate. The story was, therefore, that when it was recommended to the dying George that he go there to recover, he told the individual what he thought of that idea. However, the same doctor's notes that revealed how the king really died also included a detail on his last words. As he lost consciousness for what would be the final time, he said, God you. King is dead. Being one of Napoleon Bonaparte's best friends could be a lucrative position, for a while at least. One of his favorites was Joachim Mura, who Napoleon made king of Naples when he took over the country. Normally, Napoleon appointed one of his siblings to run places. In Naples, however, he gave the crown to Mura in 1808. The two were not related by blood, only by marriage, since Mura's wife was Napoleon's youngest sister, Caroline Bonaparte. While Mura actually did some good things while in charge of Naples, politics in Europe was a whirlwind in the early 1800s. Mura lost his throne in 1815, and when he tried to take it back, he was apprehended. In the History of Napoleon Bonaparte, John S. C. Abbott wrote that Mura was sentenced to death by firing squad. Mura turned down a blindfold, then spoke to the men aiming the guns at him, saying, Save my face, aim at my heart. Once a concubine for Emperor Wenzog of Qing, Empress Dowager Siji managed to overcome centuries of tradition and take power for herself, first alongside another former concubine in 1861, then on her own. It was unheard of for a female ruler to take control, and technically, according to China Under the Empress Dowager by J.O.P. Bland and E. Backhouse, there was a male emperor. Siji's son became Tongji Emperor, but as he was only five years old at the time, power flowed through his mother. After her son died in 1875, Siji simply placed different young male relatives on the throne in turn, so it was really she who stayed in charge for decades. Siji held on to power until her death in 1908. Considering how calculatingly and methodically she as a woman had gone after and consolidated power, Siji's official last words were hypocritical to say the least. She said, Never again allow any woman to hold the supreme power in the state. It is against the house law of our dynasty and should be strictly forbidden. 
To be fair to CG, it was not women who were her greatest concern for the royal family. That would be Unix, since she added, Be careful not to allow Unix to meddle in government matters. The Ming Dynasty was brought to ruin by Unix, and its fate should be a warning to my people. Francis Louis XIV he built the Palace of Versailles into the giant golden building tourists flock to today, put the hairbands of the 1980s to shame with his coif, and consolidated power despite being only four years old when he took the throne. However, one thing Louis didn't do was say the most famous quote ascribed to him, which translates to, I am the state. However, he made up for it with his final words. Louis's last years had been sad, with many of his relatives dying young in a difficult war. But on his deathbed in 1715, aged 76, Louis still understood his place and purpose in life. Speaking in French, he said, I am leaving, but the state will always remain. They were virtually perfect last words for a monarch who had effectively made himself the center of France's world. However, considering he thought of the state firmly in terms of the monarchy, he was also wrong. In 1789, the French Revolution ended the rule of the royal family. To the barricades! Empress Elizabeth of Austria, popularly known as Sissy, was set up to have a perfect life, at least on paper. She was stunningly beautiful and came from a wealthy, important family. When Emperor Franz Joseph, seven years her senior, met Elizabeth for the first time, he fell in love at first sight and refused to marry anyone else. So, in 1854, Elizabeth became empress of one of the most powerful countries in Europe. What followed was a deeply difficult time. Sissy's mother-in-law hated her. The aristocrats and others in her social class hated her. Her only son, Crown Prince Rudolf, died in a murder-suicide in 1889 along with his lover, and Elizabeth's own death would be just as violent. In 1898, the Empress was in Switzerland traveling under a fake name with her friend and attendant Countess Irma Sturay, according to the book Elizabeth, Empress of Austria and Queen of Hungary. However, her real identity got out, and Italian anarchist Luigi Luceni decided to kill her. While waiting to board a ship, he got close enough to Elizabeth to stab her in the chest. As Elizabeth collapsed, the Countess didn't even realize anything was wrong, thinking the Empress had only fainted. She was rushed onto the boat where she collapsed again. Finally seeing blood on her clothes, she asked, bewildered, what has happened? She then lost consciousness and died a few hours later. Considering how he lived, it's frankly astonishing that George IV survived as long as he did. He drank and ate to such a degree that by the end of his life in 1830, he refused to go out in the society he loved because of how large he had become. According to The Age of Scandal by T.H. White, he was also losing his sight and to some extent his mind. The 1926 biography George IV supports this last point, saying that while the king had always been fond of exaggerating, as he slowly died over the course of weeks, fantasies he told his visitors about his achievements became more ridiculous. He even claimed that he played a key role at the Battle of Waterloo, despite having never left England during the conflict with Napoleon. George's death was long and drawn out, so much so that even his former non-royal wife Maria Fitzherbert had time to learn he was gravely ill, travel to London, and write him hoping to be called to see him before he died. Based on his last words, it's clear that George's doctors downplayed just how dire a situation the king was in, or at least how much time he really had left. On June 26th, he suddenly woke up after sleeping a full 24 hours and shouted, This is death! Oh God, they have deceived me. 